is covering the spread. Here are your hosts, Jim Sawness and Dr. Ed Feng. What is going on, everybody? Welcome on into Covering the Spread. That's right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com, where today we are getting you set for a big weekend in college football by talking to Edward Egros of TVG's More Ways to Win, getting his thoughts on this week's slate and the biggest games and where he sees value on the board. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for numberfire.com, joined here as always by Dr. Ed Feng. You can find his work over at thepowerrank.com. Ed, we've talked a lot about Michigan and how people in Arbor are still skeptical about this team, but then they go out and they beat Wisconsin 38-17. So yeah. has the vibe shifted yet, or are we still skeptical of Michigan? Yeah, I mean, I think it's slowly starting to shift. I think some people... I don't think people have caught up to my optimism for the team. And I think, um, I don't know. I think this team is pretty good. I think this team could be even better if, uh, if JJ McCarthy can be the freshman quarterback that we thought, I mean, he's clearly got a gun. He's clearly got a lot of high upside. I think we're seeing a little bit of a ceiling with McNamara. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think you, I, I think you can be like, yeah, we played Wisconsin. Their offensive line sucks. The quarterback got hurt. He was probably terrible to begin with. So I think there's still some of that going on. And, um, but yeah, no, no, it was, it, it was clearly a good win. I think they're pretty good. It, uh, you know, it's interesting. It's obviously a very close spread uh, on the road at Nebraska this week, a Nebraska team that has, has clearly changed since that opening game against Illinois. So, yeah, I mean, I think once we get through this game, we'll see. I, I think things will, might change even more, but uh, it'll be interesting this week with uh, with the night road game. Yeah, with Nebraska, I was grateful I could not watch their game this past weekend against Northwestern because uh, it was a train wreck. But going to try to try to find plans during Northwestern games the rest of the year, too, to avoid ever <laughs> watching them again. So that's the goal. Very grateful to be busy last weekend. Hopefully we can uh, find a similar thing this upcoming weekend. But I think uh, a much better game this time around for nebraska and that that michigan team should be a lot of fun we're not gonna talk about that game we'll talk about uh plenty though actually we'll talk about that game a bit with edward egros you can find him over uh on twitter at ed with sports you can find him on tvg's more ways to win he is also now doing some tennis stuff for nbc sports edge so we'll talk to edward about that he of course is a professor at smu and pepperdine as well we're going to preview college football week number six with edward Coming up in just a bit, but also tomorrow, we're going to have our NFL preview for week five by talking to John Sheeran, the director of trading at FanDuel Sports, but getting his thoughts on bookmaking in 2021, alterations they've made, and get his thoughts on the bookmaker perspective on some games for NFL week number five as well. So that'll be up tomorrow. Get that by subscribing to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts. We're going to have a podcast, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Podcasts. You name it, you can find us there to get John's thoughts on week number five. Before we talk to Edward, though, got to go back to last week. We had Ryan McChrystal on a sharp football analysis, and it was a complete clean sweep for Ryan. Covering the past. So we had Ryan McChrystal on to preview week five. You can find him on Twitter at Ryan underscore McChrystal. And as mentioned, find his work over at Sharp Football Analysis. And Ryan went three for three here. The big one was Cincinnati against Notre Dame. He said he bet this earlier in the year when Notre Dame was favored. He had uh, Cincinnati as a, an underdog there. And he said that had he not bet that, he would have bet it again at minus one and a half for Cincinnati at that point as well. He closed at minus two. It's so even a bit more movement in his favor. And Cincinnati... Kicked some butt in this game. Their passing game was far more efficient. They averaged uh, 9.3 yards per attempt compared to Notre Dame's 5.6. They won it 24 to 13 uh, to get Ryan the win on the cover. And Ed, he was on uh, Cincinnati early. Yep. What are your numbers saying about Cincinnati right now after the Notre Dame game? Uh, it, it's pretty good. I mean, they're they're top, uh, what, they're fourth when I only look at metrics from this season adjusted for opponent. So that that's that's clearly pretty good. This is a pretty solid team. Um, I mean, I, I still have some questions about the about their quarterback play, but the defense is great, and they're. I mean, they have to at least be in the conversation uh, for a playoff spot. Where do they grade out for you if you include your priors in there as well? Uh, that's kind of a complicated question because yeah. things are um, well. So they're actually fifth when I look at my predictor okay. model. Okay. So so it's not, yeah. So I'm doing things a little bit differently this year. So it's not just you know how to how, how is it 
against the prior where right. it's a mixture of of preseason and and what we have from the current season it's a little bit different but um but yeah i mean the numbers like this team okay very good so good call by ryan there ryan said he liked boston college at plus 15 and a half against clemson closed at clemson minus 14 and a half and the bc defense came to play here they actually had a shot to win the game outright. They were down six with two minutes left, got the ball all the way down to the Clemson 11 yard line, but then fumbled the snap. Uh, they lost uh, 19 to 13, but still easy cover for Ryan there. And Ed, this Clemson offense just discombobulated across the board right now. Yeah. And they kicked a lot of field goals uh, as well in this game. And uh, I mean, I also feel like Clemson's defense probably had the first bad game of the year. Uh, against the uh, you know the backup quarterback for BC as well, so uh, things are not looking good for Clemson right now. So we'll see we'll yeah. see how things uh, continue to progress. Definite shakeup at the top uh, with it being Georgia Alabama. We'll talk to Edward about his thoughts on who is number three with Clemson being a little dusty in that conversation in just a bit. But uh, we also had Ryan on USC minus seven and a half against Colorado. He was not into Colorado at all, and he thought USC had responded well to the head coaching change. So he was on USC. Minus seven and a half. It closed at USC minus nine. And then they won that game by 23. So great to get across the board by Ryan McChrystal. We enjoy having him on here. And that is a big part of why. Sharp guy. Find him on Twitter at Ryan underscore McChrystal. And check out his work over at Sharp Football Analysis. Means big shoes for Edward Egros to fill for this week. You can find Ed, Edward on Twitter at Ed with Sports And check him out on TVG's More Ways to Win. We're going to talk to him about week number six in just one second. But first, FanDuel Sportsbook is running back. It's risk-free same-game parlay for week five in the NFL. All you got to do is go to sportsbook.fanduel.com, place a three-plus leg same-game parlay in any week five game. If your bet loses, get a refund and site credit. It is that simple. Head over to FanDuel Sportsbook today and get in on the action with their risk-free same-game parlay. Must be 21-plus and present in Arizona, Colorado, Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, Virginia, or West Virginia. Refund issued is a non throwable site credit that expires in seven days. Max refund $10. Restrictions apply. See terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Same game parlay available for multiple sports in all states on web and mobile. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit fanduel.com slash RG. In Indiana, 1-800-9-WITH-IT. For confidential help in Michigan, 1-800-270-7117. In Tennessee, call the red line at 1-800-889-9789. In West Virginia, 1-800-GAMBLER.net. In Arizona, call 1-800-NEXT-STEP or text next step to 53342. Covering the present. Let's bring Edward Egros into covering the spread to break down college football week number six. Edward, it is a pleasure to have you back with us here for today. How you doing? I'm doing well, doing well. Just got back from New York for a wedding and it was the first uh, trans cross-country flight that I have uh, done. And so... I, uh, I'm learning as far as like which airline to go to as far as leg room and, okay. you know, free <laughs> Wi-Fi, those kinds of things. And I feel like I'm an expert now. Are you going to fill out like a scouting report for us or get the full details or we have to like, you know, pry a little bit here to get the full, the full rundown? <laughs> well, no, the, the key thing here is like always bring a book. You know, that, that's the first thing because Wi-Fi could be spotty and you're never going to know if it's going to work or not. And so bring a book, have some podcasts saved up, ready and raring to go. And at least have that part out of the way. It's where, you know, whatever happens, happens. It's also important, uh, you know, if you do have to spend a couple of extra bucks, I know it's kind of a positive EV kind of thing, but the extra leg room does matter here. Uh, two hours, maybe three hours, depending upon, uh, you know, your physiological makeup, maybe you can survive it. But I think once you get to say like the four to five hour mark, you really do need to move around and fidget. Otherwise things will solidify on you. And uh, let's say rigor mortis could happen a little sooner in your life than you would anticipate. Yeah, it ain't great. I'll tell you that. Uh, two, <laughs> two to three is generous, by the way. I'm not sure two to three even works at this point. Like that's yeah. uh that's a tight squeeze for me as well. So uh, I, I think I'm on board with that as well. Although the cheapskate tendencies in me also <laughs> tend to win out either way. Now, I do want to talk to you before we talk about uh, football for today too. You got a new gig uh, working for NBC Sports Edge and doing tennis. Uh, mm -hmm. That's pretty cool. Uh, how's that been going so far? 
So far, so good. Uh, only been doing it for a month. Uh, brought on uh, during the U.S. Open, so obviously the stakes were high as far as making sure that uh, my writing was up to snuff and, uh, you know, my picks are uh, equally as much. Uh, but it's been great. Everybody's been wonderful. And uh, it's cool to talk about this new venture, in, in, in part because I still feel like when it comes to tennis, there are still edges to be had. Uh, it's not, as say, as sharp a market as, say, the NFL is. And because of that, it does feel like there's some real opportunities to explore and talk about tennis in a whole new way because it's not say as analytically driven as some of the other sports, you know, certainly not like baseball. And because of that, because the data is a little bit tougher to come by, there are opportunities to make a couple of bucks here and there. Nice. Would you say that the tennis or the golf market is tougher to beat? I would say golf is tougher to beat just because I think, Hmm. you know, especially with like strokes gain numbers and things like that, there are bits of advanced data that, are available out there. Tennis is a little bit tougher to come by outside of, say, the Grand Slams. And and so because of that, you're having to sort of piece things together, sort of figure out, okay, given this matchup, you know, what does this serve look like? What can this person do, say, in terms of return volleys and things like that? Uh, you know, is a one-hand backhand more appropriate here? Y- you have to be a little bit more strategic as far as piecing data together. But once you do that, you have opportunities. <laughs> The cool thing with you being in LA is you're actually in studio for more ways to win now, which throws me off every time <laughs> I see you there. Like, cause I'm used to seeing you in your office and, mm-hmm. and seeing you in studio at like each time, I know it's been like five weeks now, I guess yeah. more than that. Cause you did a couple preseason shows too, but like uh-huh. it still throws me off. So what's it like for you in LA during football season, actually doing stuff in person now? Well, it's a weird kind of being confined to a box, you know, sure, yeah. like I can't, I can't move out. You know, it's, it's like the mime thing where it's like closing <laughs> in on you. Uh, it, it's wonderful. It, it's wonderful. I mean, there's still plenty of things that I do from home. And so it's yeah. not like I, you know, I'm constantly, you know, traveling Los Angeles per se, but it's, it's wonderful to see Dave and Lisa and the whole crew. I mean, they, they've been wonderful. And plus I think there's this sort of camaraderie that's harder to achieve when you're doing things through a webcam and, and through your laptop where okay they're they're fun voices they're nice friendly voices but at some point it's nice to shake a hand or do an elbow bump or or what have you uh and plus what's great about the tvg studio there's always bottled water everywhere uh someone's (laughs) always offering me one no one offers me bottled water here in my home office uh which is quite disappointing i'll have to you know start cutting pay but in the meantime, you know, the crew is wonderful. It's good to sort of see bright lights and, you know, it feel more animated and comfortable because you know how it is. Like you can't move your hands around very much when you're sort of confined to this box. But here you can walk, you can move around. And it's nice. I do still move my hands around. I just look a lot less sane when I do it. Like, uh, <laughs> so like it, it still happens. It just looks better when I'm doing it, when I'm yeah, not exactly. alone in my office. So I think that uh, that's, that's a good perk for sure. So I'm glad things are going well there uh, and overall for you so far. Let's talk about some college football now. And we talked about this on the NFL side of things, talking about home fields, talking about uh, penalties and stuff like that. We haven't talked to people about this from a college perspective, though. So have you made any tweaks to your numbers this year to account for changes this year? You know, anything noteworthy standing out in terms of how you view spreads, totals, et cetera, et cetera? When you talk about home field advantage from the college side of things, it's always been the case where college football home field advantage matters just a little bit more than, say, the NFL does. Not necessarily by some substantial margin, but it's enough, especially when you're dealing with a sharp market, to find that extra half point, full point, and then have those opportunities to exploit. As far as home field advantage this college football season, I, I haven't necessarily seen anything that that suggests it's uh, too out of the ordinary from, say, what we've seen in, in seasons past. So as far as that's concerned, I haven't been doing a whole lot of adjusting. The one thing, though, that is interesting here, and this is actually uh, some subject matter that I did uh, for the Power Ranks uh, podcast series, and that is that when part of this deal here is you have to combine the analytics with sort of brute force research. And that is absolutely necessary uh, in terms of the betting world, because you're going to learn things that have super small sample sizes that you do have to account for in some manual fashion. And for me, especially when you're dealing with, say, the right tail of the distribution curve in terms of futures, who's winning things, what matters here is is a hot shot quarterback or a hot shot offensive coordinator going to work well with everyone else? Will it kind of come together and gel to where you're going to get something uh, 
truly outlierish. And this is where the research comes in. So go back in recent history, as far as uh, college football is concerned, uh, say like Joe Burrow with LSU, getting Joe Brady, his passing game coordinator for one year, when uh, Joe Burrow had nothing to show for his career up to that point. Uh, you look at Cam Newton with Auburn, uh, getting Gus Malzahn in his OC, having one year at Auburn being magical and arguably the greatest season that I've ever seen from any one college football player. That's what you're looking for as far as the, the, the magical trends sort of coming together and gelling at just the right time to where you get those, you know, outlandish futures, so to speak. And if you can find those, then oftentimes you can exploit them, but you also have to run away from them just as quickly if, say, things aren't working quite as well. So one example where I didn't get it quite right was, say, Emory Jones of Florida. Here's someone who I thought, you know, because he's such a mobile guy, that he's exactly who Dan Mullen would want for the Gators and that it was going to work that much better. We haven't seen it so far. And because I'm looking for outliers, basically, it, it's not going to be one of them. So I'm better off backing away. At the same time, I like this process much more than, say, just assuming, okay, another quarterback, another year in the system, it's going to get that much better. That's not what I'm looking for as far as winners are concerned. I'm looking for who's already who already has the talent. And then what magical combination of coaching will put them over the top? Magical combination of offensive line, receivers, things like that. That is something that I've stressed that much more this year. Um, but I've also been just as willing to run away from it if there's any sign of danger. I want to talk about the small sample thing quick because that's something that I tend to skew towards a lot as well uh, mm -hmm. for baseball specifically, but also with football because I feel like I'd rather use – a smaller sample of good data than a larger sample of bad data. Do you find yourself doing that in other sports too, not just college football, trying to be reactive to small samples when you think they're more impactful? Sometimes. And I, I hate to say it depends because I know that's a cop-out answer. It's true though. <laughs> but but that's the thing though, is that, yeah, I, I'm with you completely that quality of data matter in the in the grand scheme of things unfortunately uh, what what is quality uh you know my definition of quality may not be the same as as anyone else's and i think at least if you have something to work with then you're you're better off than say the whole garbage in garbage out approach so especially when it comes to college football where everything really is small sample size i i'm probably more willing in this sport to go after higher quality data than say uh, the NFL or certainly baseball where say like my tolerance level is a little bit lower because I know there's a lot more plentiful stuff out there. For sure. Uh, so Edward, so we kind of have two teams at the top, Georgia and Alabama, mm -hmm. expecting those teams to meet in the SEC championship game and sort them things out. Um, do you agree with that? And, and if so, who do you, who would you put at third based on your numbers and uh, analysis of the game? I, I definitely believe that it's Alabama one and Georgia two. I know uh, others would probably uh, flip flop that given that I think Georgia has looked more impressive as of late, especially that big win over Arkansas with, you know, your second string quarterback. Uh, no doubt that was impressive. Um, Ed, I hope you're not expecting me to say Michigan is number three because, nope. uh, because if you, okay, okay, good, good, good. So we're in agreement there. Uh, I'd like to stir a little controversy up if I may. Uh, it's what mid, uh, beginning of October is we're, uh, doing this. Um, I'm going to pick a team that has a loss already as my number three. That's what I'm going to do. And I'm going to go with Ohio state as my oh. third best team because okay. the, the big thing here for me is first off, I think, you know, one month into the season, I think it's, that's enough for me to feel comfortable taking a one loss team as, and putting them high. I think that's fine as far as that's concerned. But the big thing with power rankings is what do you want your power rankings to do? Do, do you want it to be like the AP poll and say, okay, who's most deserving of number three uh, based upon resume? Is it, okay, this is who I think is going to, you know, make the college football playoff at number three based upon committee criteria uh, or criteria? Uh, or is it, okay, here are the advanced metrics and these are what the advanced, met advanced metrics say is the third best team uh, or the betting market says is the third best team, whatever it is. What do you want your power rankings to do? And for me, because I'm such an analytics goofball, I want uh, the numbers to point me in the right direction, even if there is a loss. I don't necessarily mind that. What Ohio State did 
uh, to Rutgers was truly impressive, especially given that Michigan played Rutgers as well, and it was a much closer game. Yeah, Ohio State has that loss to Oregon, but Oregon's a quality opponent, and there are a lot of teams that have not played a single quality opponent up to that point. EPA per play margin, Ohio State is third behind Georgia and Coastal Carolina, so to me, that matters a good bit. Um, Offensive EPA is Ohio State third. Uh, C.J. Stroud's completion percentage, I wish, were a little bit higher, but uh, Travion Henderson, quite the rushing start. Good offensive line for them. Garrett Wilson, Chris Olave are great. There are enough playmakers offensively for me to feel comfortable that Ohio State will be just fine by season's end, and they're still in great position to win the Big Ten, which, uh, again, by power rankings, quite, quite difficult. You put all of that together, and I'm more than comfortable putting Ohio State third. A lot of my numbers would would definitely agree with that. I feel like a lot changed over this past week. I feel like we came into last week, and uh, I don't know if I said this publicly, but I thought it was they had a really important contest against Rutgers as a I think a fourteen point favorite on the road. They hadn't looked particularly good before then. The defense had a ton of question marks. I'm not sure that those are all forgiven, uh, especially on the defensive side of the ball, but. But they got it done against the Rutgers team that had looked good already. So, yes, a lot of my metrics agree with that as well. Mm-hmm. And, and strength of schedule, I think, matters a good bit. I mean, I know Michigan's has been, uh, you know, quite good. But Ohio State's hasn't been too bad either, uh, given who they've played up to this point. I I do think you still have to keep the strength of schedule metrics in this. And I know you, you kind of do throughout the entire season. At some point, it almost doesn't matter at all. Uh, but to me, I think it still does a good bit. And Ohio State's played some quality competition. And for the most part, they've looked good against them, all of them, off- offensively at least. Uh, yeah, you have some fluke things here and there. But I wouldn't dwell too much on an Oregon loss and all of a sudden throw them away. They're not like, say, Clemson, where I don't know if I've seen more than, say, one and a half good games out of them. Uh, that's a completely different animal altogether. Where would those one and a half games be? <laughs> uh, <laughs> South Carolina State of, was that? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like a quarter here, a quarter there. Right. You know, it's, just, it's like a buffet at this point. It's yeah. uh, tough to cobble that together for sure. Right. So let's talk about some games here and yeah. get to a big rivalry: Oklahoma versus Texas. Oklahoma here, three and a half point favorite. Total is sixty-three and a half. Refreshing to see a Big Twelve total back up in the sixties. So that's uh, a. <laughs> It's a good thing for me. I know weird to say that, but hey, it's been a strange year. Mm-hmm. Oklahoma, uh, three straight wins, and uh, for their past five, have been by one possession. So a lot of very close games for Oklahoma. To you, Edward, does that indicate that their success is a bit fluky, or have they potentially just underperformed and, and made those games closer than they should have been? If this is my dissertation uh, for this episode, I think my thesis here is that we are deep enough into the season to start concluding things or making some real important uh, declarations. And I think one of them that is important here is that when it comes to Oklahoma, EPA per play offensively is 25th. And if Spencer Rattler is supposed to be the next coming, the next great quarterback for the Sooners, it needs to be higher than that. 25th isn't bad. Don't get me wrong. They can still win the Big 12, but 25th is not good enough uh, if you are really supposed to live up to the expectations that were set and have Heisman attention, all of those things. The sample size is large enough to make that conclusion. I don't think the record is fluky, uh, but I'm not exactly sure who they've played necessarily, who they who's convinced me that Oklahoma is sort of worthy of national title contention. I think our preseason rankings, if you want to go that far, yeah, they're better than West Virginia and Nebraska. I don't think anybody was questioning that. But are they worthy of the sixth spot? I don't think so at all. And not that Spencer Rattler has been playing poorly necessarily, uh, but it's not living up to expectation. And there are some defensive problems for Oklahoma, especially after, you know, all the retooling that they've done over the last couple of years still hasn't worked out yet. Um, will they run the table at this point? I need to see more to feel comfortable, and I haven't. So how are you seeing this game play out here? If we're skeptical of Oklahoma, Texas has been playing some good football recently. Yeah, Is that enough has. to get you to, to be in on Texas here? As far as the spread goes, that may be a stay away for me uh, just because there is some volatility. I love the under in this game. Uh, 63 and a half going oh, under. Man. I have... <laughs> I, well, it, well, it's a large total, and it, it's, and I haven't exactly researched this, but it's always seemed to to me with the Red River Showdown that both offenses are highly billed, highly touted. You're expecting a ton of points, and then it doesn't happen. And I feel like that's going to happen again here, where 
you know, Texas is going to run the ball a lot, grind the clock, fewer possessions, try to keep the ball out of Spencer Rattler's hands. I know it's not the necessarily the best recipe for success, but if they're going to do it, then anticipate they're going to do it and then bet on that because of it. And I'm expecting kind of a grinded out kind of game where we don't have as many possessions to get to such a high score. Interesting. All right, let's move on to another potential low scoring game. We have Georgia uh, versus Auburn. Georgia's moved from a 14 and a half to a 16 and a half point favorite in this game. Total of 46 and a half. Questions at the quarterback position for Georgia. JG Daniels didn't play last week. Didn't seem to matter. Uh, Stetson Bennett uh, came in and, and did a decent job. So the market seemed pretty comfortable with that. What are you seeing in this game? It's interesting to me because who starts at quarterback? I'm not necessarily sure I care who does per se. What matters a lot more is how healthy that young man is. I think health is going to matter a good bit at that position. Bennett uh, has a better PPA per play than Daniels, and that's fine, but it's a small sample size with that that one Arkansas game. So, you know, I think either way, Georgia should be just fine as long as one of them uh, happens to be healthy. But Bennett, knee laceration at last check. Daniels had an injury to his lat, which is why he didn't play the last game. So I'm not sure there's a disparity in the quarterback position, but I want to know how healthy they are. And one of the problems with Georgia specifically, and I get this is gamesmanship and it's an important game against Auburn, you know, rivalry, all that stuff. But I never quite know like what the injury status is with any of their players. Uh, for some reason, Kirby Smart likes to, to be especially uh, secretive about these kinds of things. And I, I, I understand why, but at the same time, you know, this this is a game for the fans, and they'd like to know who they're going to be watching. And so I I, I wish it weren't so secretive. And, and uh, better but, too. But the yeah, better need better. to know who's playing. <laughs> that would be nice. Yes, please think of us, coach. That yeah, would be coach. appreciated. Right. But <laughs> but still though, it, it, it it's secretive enough to where I'd like to get a little bit more information to pounce on it. I know uh you know the better number was earlier in the week, but there's a reason for that because you know the health thing is an issue, but. That's that's the the question to me is how healthy will that quarterback be, whoever it is? Yeah, and I think that that's something we still don't know. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm guessing 16 and a half probably a stay away for you at that point. Then it, it probably is, but yeah. at the same time, this may be another game where I'm comfortable taking the under. Uh, I'm just tons of fun, aren't I? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> going bunch of unders. No, but the big deal here for me is yes, defense is when evaluating defense. You want to know who they're going up against because the quarterback, the offense you're going up against will matter a good bit more than, say, the overall quality of defense. The one exception to that may be this Georgia group because defensively, in terms of defensive EPA for play, things like that, they are way better than everyone else uh, by a mile. And I just can't think of that as an outlier. At some point, there is actual talent there that is proving why their defense is so much better than everyone else's. And I take that to heart. And Bo Nix hasn't quite impressed me so much this season. Uh, you know, I did talk about new infrastructures, new head coaches, things like that. But even in the win against LSU, I didn't necessarily, you know, he ran a lot. Fine. LSU didn't account for that. Well, that's their fault. That's not necessarily something that Bo Nix is showing in terms of, you know, being the ultimate dual threat quarterback. So there, there's some issues there that, uh, you know, I'm not quite comfortable with as far as Auburn is concerned. Low scoring game, Georgia takes it. Yeah, I don't, I don't think Bo Nix can get the ball down the field effectively. It was the Daniel Jones in week two approach where you're like, oh, the throw is going to be tough. So, like, let's just run. Let's see what happens. Let's party. Right. And it worked. Kudos to them. I, I like the cop there. That's good. Yeah. I mean, da I, I don't want to besmirch Daniel Jones too much. He's played pretty well past two weeks. <laughs> He's played remarkably. But remarkably well week two that was definitely the approach he's been better since then so kudos to danny dimes for regaining uh <laughs> the nickname there let's move now to a big game in the big 10 penn state versus iowa iowa now one and a half point favorite that was two and a half before total here 41 and a half and iowa's defense is always the headliner here but mm -hmm. Their offense actually put up a big number last week in a tough spot against Maryland. Where a lot of people thought Maryland might be pretty competitive in that game. Are you buying into this Iowa offense or are we still skeptical there? I'm not buying into it yet. I'm willing to at some point, but I'm not ready just yet. You mentioned the defense being the headliner. 
I think the special teams too uh, need to get discussed as far as Iowa is concerned. Short fields, you know, that's the big reason why the offense has, uh, you know, been scoring a good bit. But uh, when you look at kick returns, punt returns, top 20, top 30 in America uh, in terms of, you know, your metric du jour, um, everyone else uh, or everything else as far as the uh, team is concerned has helped them uh, have short fields to where the offense has been asked to do very much. This is going to be one of those situations where uh, against Penn state, I'm expecting the defense and special teams to sort of continue uh, a decent to outstanding performance. And then offensively, we may have just as many questions, uh, but which side am I more comfortable with? Uh, I'm more than okay with the Hawkeyes. Okay. So I will minus one and a half here. Are you looking towards the money line spread? How do you want to attack this one? I like the spread here. I, I think Iowa can take this by a field goal. You know, something else too, we talked about home field advantage. I think that does matter when you're dealing with a small number like this. And Iowa at home, uh, you know, especially knowing uh, how high the stakes are and, and how well things have turned out so far, uh, I got to believe uh, fans are going to come out and make this interesting. Awesome. Any other college football games that you're interested in at FanDuel Sportsbook? Arizona State minus 12 and a half. It's a big spread against Stanford. And I know both teams uh, have some quality wins within the conference, but I, I like the Sun Devil team. Jaden Daniels, great completion percentage. Nearly 1,400 all-purpose yards already. Uh, Rashad White averaging more than five yards a carry. Offense EPA per play is third in America, and we are not talking about Arizona State enough. So to me, the number is not sharp enough. And I'm comfortable with uh, the 12 and a half number and uh, laying those points. Uh, also, Michigan, Nebraska, the over uh, feels pretty intriguing in that one because after a really slow start for the Cornhuskers, offensively, they're starting to put it together. And to me, they may be able to, to keep an interest. I mean, the spread's what, three and a half? Uh, that's that's an interesting number here. And to me, when you have a close game like this, you're going to get a little back and forth. So I like the points and I'll take the over. So are we, are we talking, we're that. talking faith in uh, Adrian Martinez. We are, we, we're, we're faith and scoring enough points, maybe not winning a game, but you know, either doing that or having enough turnover worthy throws to uh, turn it into a blowout and you get the over that he way. looked great last week, Ed. Definitely not because of the defense. Well, so, Definitely so not because of the thing. team he was facing. Yeah. I, I, ha I actually haven't seen the kid play since Illinois. So I, you know, <laughs> that, that's why I'm asking because he looked terrible in that opener maybe northwestern just fixes everything you know right maybe they can like, fix all ills for opposing teams i mean yeah, you guys remember like 2000 and 2018 he was great as a freshman and and we all came in to 2019 this nebraska's gonna get it done was, and yeah he's got the best quarterback coach in america mario reduceco and i put that on my podcast and <laughs> 2019 happened so ed is still burned it's still i'm just, I'm just yes. hey, you got to know when you were wrong, and I was wrong on that one. So um, it's actually been interesting to kind of evaluate like people's preseason takes and how good and bad, you know. Like I, I don't know. No one is like hitting eighty to hundred percent of their preseason takes. Yeah. I, I'm don't, certainly not. Don't go back to when I was on Ed's podcast and mentioned how Marcus Mariota was was bound to have a good year for Tennessee a couple years ago promptly got benched so we don't need to discuss mm -hmm. what we've gotten wrong uh, in the past because there's plenty to discuss there <laughs> that is edward egros check him out on more ways to win of course on nbc sports edge as well uh if you're in pepperdine or smu you know check him out there too because it, why yeah. not you know swing on by <laughs> and talk to him there edward we appreciate the time as always good luck to you with more ways to win this week and also with your college football bets we'll talk to you soon sounds good appreciate it covering the future. Big thank you to Edward Egros for singing by and breaking down week six in college football. Ed, he likes the over for Michigan versus Nebraska at 50 and a half. We didn't talk about your read on that game earlier on. So what do you think in your Michigan versus Nebraska with Michigan, a three and a half point favorite? Yeah. My number is like Michigan by about, about two ish. So the markets have definitely been ahead of my model on Michigan. It was, you know, more so, uh, last week and the model's kind of catching up. Um, there will definitely be some work this off season to see how aggressive I should be with my adjustments. Uh, I kind of get the feeling that I'm not being aggressive enough, but you know, I think the market's probably in the right place. I think Michigan does win this game. I don't feel like I'm really equipped to, uh, kind of evaluate Nebraska because the last time I saw them play was, was right. that opener against Illinois. Uh, obviously things have, have changed a little bit since then. 
Um, you know, played Oklahoma pretty tough, but also don't not exactly sure what that means as well. Right. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think I think it's a pretty important test for Michigan. They certainly can't come out and uh, and not play well. I think they'll they'll <laughs> that would not that would not go well. But uh, but yeah, it's, it should be a great game. That's be a fun atmosphere too, because that stadium is sick. Um, I yep. love watching football games there. It's actually a big game too, where Nebraska's playing well. So that'll be a fun one for sure. Let's move into our covering the future for this week. Now, starting off with you, Ed, going back to that Iowa versus Penn State game. What's your read here with uh, Iowa, a one and a half point favorite? Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm I'm definitely leaning towards Penn State here. So Iowa's off to this great five and zero start, start and. Every win has been by 10 points or more, but the underlying metrics kind of tell a much different story. They had a worse success rate against Iowa State, Kent State, and Maryland, um, and the margin in success rate was pretty close against Colorado State. And and really the problem is is with the offense. Um, you know, one of the sources that I use for my preseason analysis is the PFF College Football Preview. So they have a lot of their grades, and they definitely pointed out that Spencer Petros was – was not part of the answer of why they won their last five games last year. And when you look at the data this year, uh, Iowa's offense ranks 114th uh, by my adjusted success rate. So why has Iowa been good? Well, two reasons. Uh, first, the defense. Uh, the defense is 13 when I look at my adjusted success rate. And turnovers have certainly been in their favor. So that's the second thing. Uh, they're plus 11 in turnovers. Uh, they were plus seven in turnovers against Maryland uh, in that last game. So the success rate is really the problem. Like when I do my updating, like the success rate is a big part. And if, if you're not being more successful than your opponent, mostly because of that offense, that's what's showing up there. As for uh, Penn State, you know, they're also off to a 5-0 start. I'm not exactly really sure how to evaluate them because, you know, they, they had a close win in, in Wisconsin in the opener. But, you know, Wisconsin had more yards, better success rate in that game, and has subsequently gotten destroyed by Notre Dame and Michigan. When I look at the metrics, uh, you know, the good news for Penn State is that the pass offense has been great. I kind of said Sean Clifford had a ceiling, uh, but so far so good. They're ninth in my adjusted passing success rate on offense. Uh, that's definitely better than I thought. Uh, the defense has not been as good as I expected. This has been a top 25 unit the last two years. Uh, definitely needed to replace some pieces on the defensive line, but they're 62nd right now when I look at my adjusted success rate. So overall, my model likes Penn State by ever uh just by 0.2 points to win this game so i would slightly favor penn state uh on the money line um you know this preseason i would have made it iowa about a half point favorite and when you look at data from the current season that likes iowa by two so everything points to a very very close game uh i i bet penn state plus two and a half earlier this week kind of wish i would have caught it at three even earlier this week um but you know it has moved in the right direction in my opinion and uh, I think it's going to be a good game. I think I think Penn State wins it. Hypothetically, you let's say you hadn't bet it. Would you still bet it at one and a half for Penn State, or would you, would that be a stay away for you? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't. You know, I certainly wouldn't bet as much. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I don't know how much further that's going to go. Yeah, I think, I think it's it very close to where, it where it's at. But yeah, I and think if that... you don't think it's going to go further, then hold off. Yeah, probably should stay away from it. Yep, exactly. Okay, so Ed is on Penn State plus two and a half. My cover in the future, starting off with the NFL. We'll do two there this week, and this one has already moved, so I want to get in on it now. That's the Chargers money line at minus 120 against the Browns. I was pretty shocked when the Browns opened as favorites here. Baker looked really bad against the Vikings, and I like Baker a lot, but uh, didn't look good there. And even though the Browns' defense has been good the past two weeks, the Chargers have been good pretty much all year long as well. If you look at the 2021 data alone, the Chargers defense ranks third overall and second against the pass based on number fires metrics. The Browns are ninth and seventh respectively. So the defensive edge, both based on my prior and what we've seen this year, belongs to the Chargers. And I think that they're better offensively too. My priors were higher on the Chargers offense entering the year and it's played out that way. They rank 11th in number fires metrics, whereas Cleveland is down in 20th. If you combine the priors with the 2021 data, the Chargers eighth in my power rankings while the Browns are 15th. So even if we assume that there is no home field in LA, which is a fair assumption based on the way things have gone so far this year, this one would still favor the Chargers by a decent amount. I've got the Chargers as 3.6 point favorites. 
So I could bet them at minus 115 with minus 110 on that side. Honestly, I'd rather just take the money line here at minus 120. I think that's a better way to bet this game right now. Their implied odds there are 55%, rounding up to 55%. I've got them at 62% to win this game. So I will take the extra flexibility and grab the Chargers money line here at minus 120 against the Browns. And I know preseason, you were not buying the Browns. Yep. You talked last week about how their defense was softening your stance as far as being opposed to them. What do you think about this game here between the Chargers and the Browns? Yeah, I mean, my model has it like dead even 50 50. Um, so I think the interesting thing with Cleveland is like, yeah, their pass defense looks pretty good. Uh, I haven't really broke it down. I think it was, I think they were like fifth when I look at adjusted uh, passing success rate. And you know, we kind of talked this preseason about like, well, maybe they could be good, right? They have Miles right. Garrett, they have Denzel Ward, and then they got two Johnson. additional pieces yeah. from the Rams, who were who were excellent last year. Still dealing with a small sample size. There's a lot of things in my NFL numbers that I don't believe to be where things are going to be at the end of the year. Um, we may talk about that tomorrow. Yeah, we may not because that stupid line moved. But <laughs> the um, Vikings won, or the. Yeah, yeah, the Vikings' pass yeah. offense doesn't look particularly good by by success rate right now. Uh, they're way lower than I expect them to finish, and yeah. they'll probably hang a pretty good number on on the Lions' defense tomorrow uh, this this weekend. Um, anyways, Cleveland, yeah, uh, <laughs> I might have been wrong on Cleveland. I think I'm, yeah. I think I was wrong on Cleveland. So this preseason, I uh, really like the under. That was probably my favorite win total reevaluating and, you know and i didn't really like the charges this preseason too and i'm yeah <laughs> also reevaluating this year justin herbert looks pretty good yeah rob Pizzola was on my podcast this week talking about how he is very excited about the justin herbert uh brandon staley duo quarterback head coach long-term yeah. prospects for uh those two guys um Look, we've got a small sample size of Brandon Staley as a as a head coach, but uh, but we'll see. I mean, but he's I, a I data definitely... nerd. What else could you want? You know. <laughs> well, but Rob also watches a ton of games. Yeah, no, 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 no. Brandon Staley is a data nerd. True. Yeah, I know. <laughs> there was that video today about yeah. him talking about play how action. play action doesn't. Uh... Yeah. Yeah. So Brandon Staley, one of us, man. That's all that matters. So uh, Chargers minus one twenty. Well, we bl- we oh, we. Wait. Wait, hold on before we talk about Brandon. Staley. So, yes, he is a data nerd in the sense that he knew about Ben Baldwin's results that like running the ball doesn't set up play action success. And that's certainly true. But he was still talking about you need to run the ball true. because of the physicality of the running game. Like you just need to hit somebody. And I was like, that is coach speak. It's not like you don't hit anybody when you're pass protecting. Right. It's not like you're not tackling anyone when you're throwing the ball. I don't think that's a quantifiable thing. Well, if he runs speed. the ball with Austin Eckler, that'd be fun for my DFS lineups this week. So I'm also yeah. okay with that. As long as he's working in my favor, we're good. So Brandon Staley, a firm uh, firm friend in my book for right now. <laughs> that is all that we for have here week. for today. But more, yeah, for this week. It's always temporary for sure. We'll be back tomorrow, though, with more NFL talk. We'll break down that Browns Chargers game in the live movement there with John Sheeran, the director of trading at FanDuel Sportsbook. You can get that podcast by subscribing to Covering the Spread. Wherever you get your podcasts, and while you are there, leave us a rating and review as well. Big thank you to Edward Egros for swinging by and breaking down college football week six. Find him on Twitter at Edward Sports. Make sure you watch TVG's More Ways to Win this week. It'll be on the FanDuel YouTube page, I think at noon on Thursday, but also, of course, on TVG as well. Ed, what is going on for you this week over at the Power Rank? I have Rob Pizzola on my podcast. I think Rob is the leader, if not uh, definitely one of the leaders, if not the leader in quantitative approaches to, to betting the NFL. We talked about his player based models. He probably told more about how he makes them and, and how he constructs them in, in the first 15 minutes there. So, and, and Rob is, is always willing to share, which is nice and potentially bad for him down the road. <laughs> uh, but yeah, anyways, he's one of the best, uh, really, really, we had a really good talk on the football analytics show. And then uh, members of the Power Rank get access to all my numbers. I'm really excited about how both of my sides models have been working uh, so far this year for NFL and college football. So you can learn more about that at thepowerrank.net. It's a URL that'll take you to a place where you can learn more about becoming a member of the Power Rank.
And to find the Rob discussion, search for the Football Analytics Show wherever you get your podcasts. Ed is on Twitter at The Power Rank. I am at Jim Sonnes, J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. You can also follow the FanDuel Podcast Network at FanDuel Podcast. Big thank you to everyone for tuning in for today. We'll talk to you once again tomorrow to talk some NFL for week number five. This has been covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. What's up, guys? This is Jordan Spieth. If you're watching this video, please like and subscribe to the FanDuel YouTube channel.